la Universidad Autónoma de Ciudad Juárez, el Instituto de Ingeniería y Tecnología, les da la más cordial de las bienvenidas a esta cátedra en esta edición. En la base J entendemos la importancia de inspirar y preparar las nuevas generaciones de estudiantes de, en ciencia y tecnología, por lo cual a partir de 2013 se cuenta con la cátedra patrimonial Douglas Ocheroff, instituida precisamente para divulgar conocimiento científico en la sociedad juarense en general y exponer a nuestros estudiantes, a las mentes científicas más destacadas a nivel mundial, a través de la impartición de conferencias magistrales y el contacto directo precisamente con estas personalidades de la ciencia, tratando de tener un impacto social, un impacto científico y por supuesto un impacto académico. En esta ocasión tenemos el honor, nos, eh, nos acompaña en eh, esta edición de eh, la Cátedra Douglas Ocheroff 2017, el doctor Justin Schwartz, quien eh, es eh, actual decano de la Escuela de Ingeniería de la Universidad de Penn State en los Estados Unidos. Sus trabajos de investigación le han valido obtener el material superconductor de más alta temperatura y la invención del Q-Diamond, uno de los materiales más duros del planeta. También es especialista en transferir conocimiento académico a la industria. Eh, el decano Schwartz recibió un, su grado de licenciatura con los más altos honores en la Universidad de Illinois, en Urbana-Champaign, y su grado de doctorado en el Instituto de Tecnología de Massachusetts, el MIT, después de trabajar como uno de los eh, primeros miembros de la Agencia de Ciencia y Tecnología adscrito en el Instituto Nacional de Investigación de Metales del Japón, se unió a la Universidad de Illinois en Urbana Champaign como profesor asistente. En 1993 el decano Schwartz se une también al recién formado Laboratorio Nacional de Altos Campos Magnéticos y al Departamento de Ingeniería Mecánica de la Universidad Estatal de Florida, en donde se desempeñó como líder de grupo de imanes y materiales de superconductores de alta temperatura. En 2003 su grupo de investigación, en colaboración con Oxford Instruments, estableció el récord mundial de generación de campos magnéticos por un material superconductor. En 2009 se une a la Universidad Estatal de Carolina del Norte como profesor distinguido de Covey Steel, como jefe del Departamento de Ciencia e Ingeniería de Materiales. En esta posición destacó por la rápida expansión del departamento, guiándolos en la clasificación nacional de los Estados Unidos del lugar 31 al 15, logrando al mismo tiempo también duplicar el número de proyectos de investigación y el financiamiento. Se une a Penn State como el Harold y el eh, e Inge Marcus Decano de Ingeniería en agosto de 2017. Los intereses de investigación de Dean Schwartz incluyen materiales superconductores, magnéticos y multiferroicos, además de sus aplicaciones. Ha publicado más de 240 artículos de revistas revisadas por pares y ha graduado 44 doctorados y maestros estudiantes en seis disciplinas académicas, incluyendo 15 mujeres y seis minorías subrepresentadas. Derivado de sus investigaciones, el decano Schwartz es cofundador y director ejecutivo de Lupine Materials and Technologies, en donde desarrollan sensores de fibra óptica para imanes superconductores de alta temperatura y capas gruesas de ferrita como antenas de microondas. También es cofundador y director ejecutivo de tecnología de Eagle Power Technologies, empresa creada para el desarrollo de la nueva generación de generadores superconductores y del Q-Carbón, material, eh, ya lo comentábamos, más eh, duro que el diamante, ferromagnético y generador de resplandor con un mínimo de energía. Y bueno, pues entre los eh, reconocimientos que ha, ha recibido el decano Schwartz se encuentran algunos eh, como estos, que es miembro de la y triple E por las contribuciones en los conductores de alta temperatura y sistemas de imanes, esto en 2004, uno de los miembros más jóvenes en la, en la historia, miembro de la ASM Internacional por el avance de los superconductores de alta temperatura y sus aplicaciones, así como el apoyo en el desarrollo de esta tecnología y su aplicación industrial por el avance de la diversidad en la ciencia, los materiales y la ingeniería, esto fue en 2015 es miembro de la Asociación Americana para el Avance de la Ciencia por las contribuciones destacadas en el campo de la superconductividad aplicada 
en particular por el avance en los altos campos magnéticos y por la integración de la experimentación y la computación, también en 2015, el IEEE Council en Superconductivity Award por las contribuciones significativas y sostenidas a la superconductividad aplicada en 2014, es un galardón más alto otorgado por la IEEE y bueno, en 2013 Van Dusser Price, este premio por el mejor trabajo en eh, transacciones aplicadas a la con superconductividad, es eh, miembro del Consejo sobre la Superconductividad Aplicada, del Consejo sobre la Superconductividad Aplicada en 2012 y bueno pues eh, también ha participado en la Agencia de Ciencia y Tecnología de Japón. Así que sin eh, más preámbulo, le damos la bienvenida y le agradecemos que esté con nosotros al doctor Justin Schwartz, quien eh, nos acompaña en esta edición de la Cátedra Douglas Dean Ocheroff 2017. Un aplauso, por favor. Le solicitamos, se encuentra con nosotros el maestro Natividad Nieto Saldaña, jefe del Departamento de Física y Matemáticas del Instituto de Ingeniería y Tecnología, que nos brinde unas palabras. Eh, bueno, pues en primer lugar quiero darles eh, una cordial bienvenida a este evento y por supuesto un agradecimiento por su asistencia y un agradecimiento muy especial al doctor Justin Schwartz, pues porque tiene múltiples actividades y a pesar de tener una agenda muy, muy saturada, aceptó venir con nosotros en esta fecha, que pues no es la fecha ideal para organizar este tipo de eventos, pero nosotros quisimos aprovecharlo eh, a, a, a como fuera, a pesar, de, a pesar de la fecha. Y pues no quiero gastar más tiempo, porque yo creo que lo interesante es la, la entrevista, ya aquí eh, Ramón les hizo una exhaustiva descripción, de, de lo que el señor, de la trayectoria del doctor, del doctor Schwartz. Nada más quisiera enfatizar de que hemos sostenido este tipo de, de eventos, esta cátedra Ocherov, en donde pues, incluso hemos tenido dos premios Nobel que han atendido esta cátedra, justamente el doctor Ocherov y el doctor Croto, y además pues otras personas muy relevantes que eh, como el doctor Barry Carter y la doctora Ana María Cheto, que eh, pues eh, hemos notado que de alguna manera inspiran y motivan a nuestros estudiantes a seguir ese camino, seguir esa trayectoria, eh, el camino de la ciencia, de, pues, de, el cual de alguna manera en un futuro beneficiará de una o de otra forma a nuestro país. Entonces, sin quitarles más tiempo, pues eh, iniciaremos con la, con la um, entrevista eh, a cargo del doctor Manuel Antonio Ramos. Gracias. Y bien, daremos, daremos eh, paso a continuación con esta interesante entrevista. Le agradecemos al doctor Manuel Antonio Ramos Murillo, quien es docente, eh, investigador del Instituto de Ingeniería y Tecnología, colaborador y encargado precisamente de llevar a cabo esta entrevista al doctor Schwartz y sin más preámbulo le, le agradecemos a, al doctor inicie con esta entrevista, solicitarles de la manera más atenta, pongan en silencio o en vibrador sus, eh, sus teléfonos, vamos a, a iniciar esta cátedra Douglas Ocherov edición 2017, gracias. Well. Uh, thank you for coming, accepting our invitation to our university. Um, can you tell us your name? <laughs> I think I can end that <laughs> Yeah, one. okay. Thank you for having me, first of all, and thank you all for coming and for the kind introduction. It's, uh, it's truly an honor to be here, and I've been looking forward to this trip. I'm glad we were able to, to find a time that worked for both of us. So, my name is Justin Schwartz, um, as introduced. Okay. <laughs> um, well, I, I'm, I'm going to start with a little bit of your background. Sure. You study an undergrad in, in engineering? Yes. And where, is, where, where, where was this? So I, I grew up in the Chicago area, um, just north of Chicago in, in Evanston, which is the um, city north of, uh, just connected to Chicago that hosts um, Northwestern University. And so my whole family um, was from Northwestern. My father got 
his, uh, all of his degrees there, bachelor's degree, PhD in material science. My mother got her bachelor's and PhD there in uh, education. Uh, my stepfather was a professor there in psychology. My older sister got her degrees at Northwestern in psychology. My stepmother went to Northwestern for her um, degree in business. Um, so when it came time for me to go to school, there was only one place I was not going to go, and that was Northwestern. <laughs> and uh, so instead, I went to Illinois, uh, University of Illinois in Urbana, which was about um, two hours south of, of Chicago. Okay. And so I studied nuclear engineering, and this was in, I don't mind giving my age. Um, so this was in the early 80s, and so it was um, an interesting time to choose nuclear engineering because it was just a few years after Three Mile Island had happened. And the, the nuclear industry was then um, in the media a lot. It got a lot of attention in terms of, you know, is it safe? And is it the, you know, at the same time you had Three Mile Island, um, there was all sorts of concerns about whether we'd run out of oil before the year 2000, which obviously we didn't. Um, and so there was this, a lot of discussion in the 70s about the energy future and, and what the world needed to do. So um, it seemed like a, a good time to go into nuclear engineering because a lot of people got out of the field because of Three Mile Island, but then there was still this huge energy need, and so it seemed like the, a good decision at the time. So the decision was made more on getting a job or on saving the world? Um, well, it's hard to save the world if you have no job, so <laughs> <laughs> probably a combination right. of both. And there was something, you know, at the time nuclear engineering, nuclear was still a very, um, it was still a new thing in the minds of the public in high school, and so it had a... Uh, it had a special attraction, I think, because it was, you know, it was sort of, so seen as nuclear science had this uh, aura about it, as if it was, um, you know, something more complicated or, or, or special. And why science? Did you grow up in a science environment, or? So I, I grew up um, always excelling in math, and with a father who was an engineering professor, um, doing material science and engineering, and so, um, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't the kid who took apart the lawnmower and put it back together. That's right. Um, I was more the one, I was the kid who had, had, you know, would be standing with his grandmother at the store and uh, I, would t I would announce what the total would be for, the, for everything we were buying before the cashier and the cashier would look at me and laugh and then I'd be right and she'd look astonished. So it was more, really I came into science and engineering as a, um, from, from the, the mathematical driven side and then um, in high school I had, uh, you know, one of the benefits of Evanston was that when other places during the baby boom were building multiple schools, um, Evanston built just one big high school. And so, um, and because of its location, because of the university in Chicago, um, it was also one of the most diverse high schools in the city. And so there was no majority population even in the 70s and 80s when I was there. Um, but because it was big, it could invest in a lot of different programs. So I was taking, I had the opportunity to take um, college level chemistry and physics as a junior and senior. And it was, uh, it was really a three-year program where as a sophomore you took high school level and then you had junior and junior seniors was college level, but it was the same two teachers for chemistry and physics all three years. And so um, they talked quite a bit, not just about the science, but about um, you know, the impact of doing science and, and the motivation for, for going, to a, going to college and, and pursuing science. And so um, even then in, in, you know, this is in the late 70s, early 80s, um, my, the physics teacher, um, was talking about a book by C.P. Snow called Two Cultures from 1959, which in, even in the late 50s was talking about this growing divide between um, the population that was you know, intelligent and educated in science and technology and math um, and the population that wasn't and how there was this, this growing divide between them. So it was two different cultures. Um, and so to me, part of the interest in science was um, you know, the idea that you know, it would be easier to try to bridge that gap if I used you know, my skills in science and, and engineering to also think about humanity and bring them together. And that's still, I think, uh, one of the fundamental themes of, of the way I view science and engineering today. Okay. And then you go to Urbana-Champaign, and then what happened? Um, so I went to Urbana and uh, had a lot of corn. It's in the middle of a cornfield. Um, got my bachelor's degree, and I, I pretty much knew going in that I was going to go to graduate school. And um, so while I was there in nuclear engineering, I learned about... Uh, this thing called fusion, fusion power, um, which, you know, and we, we, we joke a lot about fusion in some circles and that, so back then in 19, early 80s, they say, well, fusion is, you know, it's the process that, that um, works in the sun in terms of, of producing energy and heat, and if we can harness it, then all we need to do is take small amounts of water from the ocean, and we'd have enough energy to, to last for decades, and so um, that, of course, you know, when you're in your in your late teens and you're dreaming about having doing big things, there's a lot of appeal to that. And 
Um, so we used to say in, in, 19, in the 80s, I was taught that fusion was only 30 years away. And uh, now it's 35 years later, and it's about 30 years away. Um, but we've actually made huge progress. And so as an undergrad, I sort of made that pivot from um, interest in fission to interest in fusion, and then um, didn't really make that final decision until I got to graduate school. Then. And which school do you choose to So I went to, I went to MIT for grad school. Um, and to be perfectly honest, I would have gone I, to MIT as an undergraduate, um, but uh, finances make a difference also in, oh, yeah. in, in life, right? Mm -hmm. And so since um, you know, Illinois was my state school, it was inexpensive, and I, could, I, I realized in high school, I should say, my parents realized in high school, that I could get the, the, my entire degree from Illinois for less money than one year at MIT as an undergraduate. Mm -hmm. So they said, okay, you know, go to Illinois and then go to MIT for grad school. So that's what I did. I went to MIT for graduate school. Um, and when I got there, I had to choose between fission and fusion early on, and so I decided to go into fusion. Um, and I started out actually in plasma physics. I don't think you know that. So I started, in, I was interested in plasma physics because that's where the, the reaction is, right? That's where all the, the, the energy action happens. Um, and I have to say, I didn't really like the plasma physics courses that much my first year. And I also took courses in, on the technology side. Um, so I spent my first summer doing research on uh, plasma diagnostics from electron cyclotron emissions. And I have to say, I didn't like it at all. <laughs> so after, after that first year, I decided to pivot from doing more the physics side of, um, of, of fusion to the engineering side. And so I, about the same time, um, so 1987, high temperature superconductivity was discovered while I was in graduate school. And I actually already started working on low temperature superconductors for magnets. And so um, that seemed to be a, it, it seemed to be a promising direction for the long term. Because um, I realized that while fusion has this, you know, and still has this great potential for um, transforming the world's energy, it was going to take a long time. And I wanted to have, a, I wanted to have the ability um, to go into something that I could stay and do work in fusion, but I could also go and work in other areas. And, and superconductivity at that time had that, that promise. And so, um, you know, the one thing I would say, I'd, when I look back on my career, I can point to all the mistakes I've made and how many times I got lucky. But I think the one thing I started doing in graduate school that I would recommend everyone does, and I still do today, um, is to always think about, you know, not just your next step, but how your next step sets you up for the step after that. And to, to try to make moves, um, you know, that will lead to, to, to many forks in the road in terms of opportunity, rather than ones that lead you down more narrow channels. And so the shift from plasma physics to, to superconducting magnet, superconductivity was as much that decision of, of, you know, going into an area that was new, but also had a lot of different directions I could go. And then what happened after the PhD? You went to for a postdoc, right? To so Japan. So I did, I went to Japan for six months. Um, I was I was actually pretty lucky. So I was in graduate school, um, getting close to finishing, and um, you know the first discovery of high temperature superconductivity was in the U.S. The second big discovery was at a, a laboratory in in Tsukuba, Japan. Um, and when I was finishing up in grad school, my dad was actually on a um, U.S. government group trip that was visiting different laboratories. Um, in Asia, and he came back and told me about this program the Japanese had just started to try to bring um, foreign scientists from around the world to Japanese labs from anywhere from six months to two years. And um, so I applied, and it, it, the timing worked out nicely. I was interviewing for permanent jobs, so I actually interviewed for the, the faculty position at Illinois, back where I'd done my undergraduate, and had that offer, but I was defending my thesis in January, and the job was going to start in August. And so it, was, it fit nicely to then go to Japan for six months in between. Um, and I, you know, I was lucky. I got to join Maeda's group um, literally about two years after they had first discovered uh, superconductivity in the business system. Okay. And so I was dropped into this group at this time period when you know, every new result was you know, a truly new result and, and you know, nobody knew where things were going to go. Which was published on December the 25th, right? That's the right, paper? Christmas Day. That's right. Christmas Day. Yeah. Which, of course, is not as significant in Japan. But. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> well, it is now because of BISCO, but it wasn't uh, at <laughs> okay. that time. So you, and you became a professor at Rana? Yes. That's right. So I was an assistant professor in, back in nuclear engineering at um, Illinois. And uh, actually, while I was in Japan, the National Science Foundation, um, which was funding the big uh, high field magnet lab at MIT, um, was actually reviewing um, whether to continue the lab at MIT or, or move it somewhere else. It had been at MIT for about 30 years. Um, most of the world thought it was, of course, going to stay at MIT. Um, but Florida State put in a, a bid for it also. 
and the person at Florida State that led the proposal had actually just spent two years as a visitor at NSF. So he knew from inside, you know, what were the aspects uh, at the NSF that they were really unhappy with in terms of how MIT was managing the lab. Um, and so he built a proposal that was extremely strong and he got a lot of money from, from the state of Florida to, uh, to support it also. Um, and so actually I was in Japan, um, I went into the lab at like midnight so I could phone MIT during the daytime to talk to my advisor about a paper we were working on. And he actually said to me then in July, he said, you know, the NSF's gonna move the lab to Florida. Nobody else believed him, everybody thought he was crazy. And then literally about the same day I came back from Japan to the US, the NSF announced that they were moving the lab um, from MIT to Florida State. So I was at Urbana, I started there. And you know, at that time, when they decided to build the lab, all they had was a small, empty insurance building. And um, they, it, they had an idea for an innovation park. And um, an insurance company had moved in, and they said, no, you can't move in. So they, they forced them to leave. But the building wasn't big enough for the lab, so they had to you know, basically triple the size of the building. Um, and then it took a couple of years before they got started, really got started on the science side and, and putting magnets in. And so um, I got recruited down there about three years into um, my period at Illinois. And it was an opportunity I couldn't say no to. So it was you know, the opportunity to build you know, a brand new national laboratory from scratch, which happens you know, every 30 or 40 years. Um, and at the same time, join a college of engineering that at the time was only 10 years old. And so it was a chance to, to build on the, on the research side in terms of, of superconductivity and its impact on high fields, but also a chance to build um, a new college of engineering that had a, a very unique place. Um, so the, the Magnet Lab itself was part of Florida State University. The College of Engineering was jointly managed by two universities, Florida State University and Florida A&M University, which is an historically black college. And so the College of Engineering had both the mission of um, you know, being research one, but also for, for encouraging diversity in, in um, engineering. Okay. How long did you stay there? I was at, with the Magnet Lab for 16 years. 16 years. 16 years. So when we started, I mean, I'm, this is one of the things I'm proud of in my career, of many things. Um, you know, when, we, when I started there in uh, December of 1993, you know, my laboratory was just a big empty room. Um, and the Japanese were already working towards um, transitioning high temperature superconductors from um, you know, this discovery to wires to magnets. So we were behind by five years. And 10 years later, we uh, set the record by being the first ones to reach 25 Tesla in 2004. So, um, you know, that was a, it was, a, it was a fun decade. And I think we learned as much about how to do, how to do science to technology transition, how to do university industry partnership as we did about the science itself. What was, the key, what was the key role in that decision of achieve that? So the, it started with a partnership with Oxford uh, Instruments. So Oxford Instruments has owned, Oxford Instruments is a British company at the time. I think they've been bought by Bruker since. Um, but they had a subsidiary in New Jersey, Oxford Superconducting Technology, which was um, pursuing the, the processing and formation of wires using the superconducting material. But they didn't have an effort to do magnets with those wires. They were just trying to make better wire. We were the group that was trying to build magnets, but of course we needed the conductor to make magnets. And so um, we had the, the collaboration started very early on on a very small scale, making things this big. Um, you know, first we, you know, we, the big, we had a big party when we made one Tesla um, standalone, and then we got it up to three Tesla and it seemed big. Um, and then we realized that the, um, there had been a study before the Magnet Lab was formed um, that was basically saying, and was actually done before high tc was discovered, that said, what should the future of high magnetic fields be? And it said that it needed to have a, a 45 Tesla um, hybrid magnet, and it needed to have a 25 Tesla 1.1 gigahertz uh, NMR magnet, and it needed to have a 25 Tesla superconducting magnet. So at the time, you could envision how to do the first two, but when they came out with this report, there was no known superconductor that could exceed 23 Tesla. But, the, but the, the report was calling for 25 Tesla. So the Magnet Lab was founded on those three goals. But nobody was really thinking about the third goal because there wasn't a material to do it. And then high TC was discovered. Um, and you know, the way thermodynamics works, right? temperature and field are just energy. And so when, in generally speaking, when the critical temperature goes up, the critical field goes up. And it turned out that high temperature superconductors were actually very, very high magnetic field um, superconductors also. 
And so we started this small program really on the side um, with Oxford where they would give us wire and we had a, a, just a couple people who would work on how to make a magnet, how to insulate the conductor, how to wind it. Um, the material was very brittle. Um, it was very inhomogeneous. Um, but slowly we made progress and the, the more progress we made, um, it was like rolling downhill. The more progress we made, the more interest we got, the more people we could add. Um, the, the conductor at the same time would get better because they weren't trying to just make conductor in a vacuum, but they were actually making conductor, but getting feedback from people making magnets. And so that, that partnership between you know, the fundamental science, the material science, the manufacturing, um, and, and the application design all working together, I think, really accelerated things quite a bit. So in Japan, right, they had the, they had the discovery and they had you know, one of the world's best laboratories for material science, um, but they were really just pushing in one direction. Right, they were pushing the conductor forward. Um, we had this balance of, of what you'd call you know, science push and, and technology pull, right? Where technology pull is when you say, this is what we want as an outcome, and how do we pull the science to get there? And so we had this, this you know, really open collaboration. I don't think, uh, maybe this was because I was naive, um, but at no point in this whole process working with Oxford did we ever even have a conversation where intellectual property came up. So maybe that was a mistake. Um, but I don't, I don't think so. I think uh, you know, we were focused on how to advance the technology. You know, we didn't see high field magnets as being a, a near term commercial marketplace. Um, they are now, right? But that's in part because of you know, what, 15 to 20 years of, of, um, of hard work. So we were focused on how do we, you know, how do we get this goal of 25 Tesla? So, um, the, the interesting thing is the lab had a plan for a 20 Tesla resistive magnet, um, and it kept getting pushed back because it was never the highest priority. And finally, we got far enough with the, the, these insert magnets with high TC um, that we convinced the lab to finally go ahead and build the 20 Tesla resistive magnet, and that became the platform in which we put the, the five Tesla insert to, to generate the 25 Tesla combined. And you know, it's funny, usually right, when you're preparing for a world record, right, there's a lot of fanfare, everybody's you know, excited. For the most part, we were under the radar until about um, two weeks before the test, we actually had a visit from the university president, and he got excited about it. So that, that generated a little bit of buzz. But even then, um, when we made the announcement, I think most people were, even at the lab, um, didn't know it was coming. And so it was kind of a, it was kind of a special surprise in that you know, we didn't have all that pressure of, oh, you know, they're working for this world record and, and uh, you know, everybody's waiting for months to see what happens. We could just do the science and then, oh, and then, oh, by the way, we just set the world record and then all of a sudden everybody got excited after the fact. So it was a much more relaxed event. In fact, we didn't even know it at first, right? Because you have to, you, know, you run the experiment and then you have to get the Hall probe data and then you have to calculate you know, how much field did we really generate. And we actually at first thought that we were um, at like 24.8, 24.9, and then when we actually crunched the numbers, we found out it was a 25.05, and so um, I still have that empty bottle of champagne on my desk. Okay. <laughs> and then after that, you moved to NC State, right? Right. So I spent, well, I still spent another um, five years at the Magnet Lab after that, um, you know, having discussions of where do we go next, what's the next follow-on program. Um, but I've kinda, I, I got that feeling that I had, you know, when I joined the Magnet Lab, we had no high TC program. And then, you know, at that point, we had the world's premier high TC program. Right. We had set the world record. We were the program that everyone was starting to copy. I, find, I, I had this feeling that I had, I had done what I would set out to do. And I was looking for new challenges. Um, and I also was starting to think, you know, maybe 2006, 2008, somewhere in there, um, <clears throat> that high TC at some point would either make it commercially and there wouldn't be big academic programs, um, or it wouldn't make it commercially and there wouldn't be academic programs. But either way, you know, I'd be at a point in my career where um, the field I had focused on wasn't didn't have a long-term future in terms of research. And so um, I started getting interested in expanding into other things. Um, and you know, I started looking around, and the Magnet Lab um, you know, had great depth in, in the topic of high magnetic fields. That's its charter. Um, but it wasn't designed, and FSU wasn't designed to have that you know, sort of broader strength in a variety of topics that I had experienced at Illinois and MIT. So um, you know, at, at FSU, I could go down the hall and and interact with people with expertise in all aspects of high magnetic fields, applications for chemistry, biology, NMR, theoretical physics, right? Bob Schrieffer was there, Lev Gorkov was there. But if I wanted to do something completely different that wasn't high field, it was, it was, it was alone. And I've always been a very collaborative um, person from my approach. 
And so I started looking for other opportunities where um, I might both go into a different type of academic leadership and also have sort of that more traditional broad, broad strength uh, in terms of, of um, scientific capability. So the opportunity at NC State came along um, and it, uh, you know, it was one of those things I looked at a bunch of different places and they all had strengths. And there were, there were two things that stood out about NC State. One was um, it really had that, that foundational engineering um, that understood the link between engineering and tech transfer, right? So NC State is about a 10 minute drive from Research Triangle Park um, and also on its own campus has industry and government you know, integrated in with campus buildings. And so you know, I would leave my office to walk to the TEM at NC State and I would pass Eastman Chemical or Pentair um, or ABB and they all had activities right there on campus. So that was one attraction. Um, and the other attraction was actually personal. So I, when I interviewed with the, the dean at NC State, um, Louis Martin Vega, and you know, all throughout life, um, I think it's important to have people that, that serve as mentors. You know, we talk about mentorship for, for students, we talk about mentorship for junior faculty, um, but in my view, you know, at every stage of your life, you should be looking for, for mentorship and, and guidance. And so um, I felt that I connected very quickly with, uh, with Dr. Martin Vega, and so you know, NC State was just clearly the place to be. So I moved there in fall 2009, spent eight uh, fantastic years um, helping to rebuild a, a, a very strong department. Um, and started realizing at that point that <clears throat> you know, the things I wanted to do in terms of academic leadership needed the, the bigger platform than a department head might have. And so um, I would start an initiative that would really be you know, aiming for across the college, um, but without the dean's help, it, it, never, it didn't spread. And once he you know, put his hand on it, of course, it would spread very quickly. And so um, with his encouragement, I started looking at, at other opportunities for dean. And, um, you know, the job at Penn State uh, became open and, and I started talking to them and um, I actually had two uh, Penn State alums on faculty in my department plus another, no three, three Penn State alums on my de department faculty plus one who had been faculty at Penn State that we had hired and so I, even though I had never actually been on the campus of Penn State University before my interview, I felt that I, you know, I, I, knew, I knew about it for my whole career um, because it's one of those flagship uh, land grant engineering schools, but I also had a, a, a sense of it as an institution from, from those faculty. Now, in, in the Latin American culture, mm -hmm. this moving around places mm -hmm. doesn't go very well, culturally speaking. Mm -hmm. In the U.S., is a very typical. I, I've probably moved more than most people. Um, so let's see, so my father, for example, um, you know, he grew up in Chicago. He went undergrad at Northwestern, so it was a big move. It was about 15 kilometers. Um, did his undergraduate there, his graduate there. Did one year in Europe and then came back. Did it, was assistant professor through full professor and center director at Northwestern. So he was with Northwestern from when he graduated high school in the mid-50s till he left in, eight, in 1984. From there, he moved to Washington, D.C., where he had maybe three different positions, but lived in the same place the whole time. Um, that's probably more typical to maybe move once in a career, not four times like I have. Um, you know, maybe I can't keep a job, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, you know, and I know, certainly know people who, um, many, and probably the majority in academia in the US, you know, they get a job as assistant professor and they get tenured and they, they often stay there until they retire. It's not uncommon. So main, the main motivation is money or helping more? For me, it was, professional opportunities. It was, it was never about the money. Be able to help more. Yeah, be able, to be able to do more to, you know, you have a, as you have a sense of what you want to do in your life, right, then you have to find the place where you can do that. Correct. Um, and so, um, you know, I think because I, I've always had a balance of interest between the science and technology side and the impact we have on people, um, you know, the, the, the moves were always strategic for it to balance those two things out. Okay. Or maybe I'm just restless, I don't know. <laughs> you, and you mentioned Bob Schreifer. Yes. Who was that, who was that person? So, so um, Bob Schreifer, um, he's one of these people who, you know, we used to, I used to tease him that he peaked with his graduate work. So his PhD thesis was um, essentially the theory for superconductivity um, that they published um, in the late 50s that became known as BCS theory. So Bardeen, Cooper, and Schrieffer, um, that won the Nobel Prize. And so you get, you get a Nobel Prize on your PhD thesis, what do you do next? Right? 
Um, it's a bit, of a bit of a challenge. So Bardeen, of course, was the only physicist to win the Nobel Prize twice. And this was the second one he won. John Bardeen. And then Cooper was, um, Leon Cooper was the postdoc, and Schrieffer um, was the, the PhD student. And in fact, um, an interesting story about, you know, people talk about John Bardeen from the point of view of his science, right? He won two Nobel Prizes. It's an obvious topic. Um, but he was actually a very unique person in terms of understanding the human side of science. And so um, when he realized that they had solved the question of the, the theory behind Cooper super pairs. conductivity, the, copper pairs, the, co right? the Cooper pairs, and yeah. then, then the next step, which is the Schrieffer's thesis, um, they had an invited talk at, at, I think it was an APS meeting, to present it for the first time. So Bardeen didn't go. And Cooper didn't go. So Schrieffer, the, the PhD student, was actually the first person to publicly present the work that became the Nobel Prize. Wow. And that was, that was a, a decision by Bardeen to make sure that he didn't steal the spotlight from Schrieffer. Oh, wow. Great story. So what's next on your career? Stay there for now? I'll, I'll, I'll certainly be at Penn State for, I'd say, at least 10 years, if not my whole career. And I always, I always take the attitude, it's funny, I've moved, what, three times now. Every time I move, I always go in with the mindset that, um, you know, I want to build the environment that I'll spend the rest of my career in, right? Is this and your first time in Juarez, right? This is my first time in Juarez, yes. And from what you're seeing, from the airport to here, what do you think about the cities, the urban? So I came in at night, so I didn't, yeah. I didn't see too much. Too much, yeah. Um, <laughs> the airport was nice, I have to say, yeah, in El Paso. So, um, you know, I'll tell you one thing that's impressing me already in, in Juarez is this, the size of the crowd in the room. So to get this many students to see a speaker in, in the U.S., there has to be food. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, I think you know, there's, there's a, a feeling of energy on campus and with the students and, and you know, being here to, to hear an interview. Um, is very impressive, and I think, um, you know, I had never seen UTEP's campus, I had never seen, seen the campus here in Juarez before. Um, clearly, is that this, this is an environment of growth, um, and I think, you know, both sides of the river will benefit from crossing the river as often as possible. Uh, you know, I think the, you know, think back on, on things that lead to success um, in science and technology and life, um, collaboration is almost always at the heart of it. You know, we, we look at, at student success. One of the things we do in, in big universities, we say, what are the things that lead to student success? What are the things that prevent student success? And we, find, you know, we talk about, you know, hard work is important, and it is important, don't, don't get me wrong. Um, in engineering, we're more about efficiency than hard work, right? Hard work is usually waste heat, <laughs> and uh, efficiency is far more valuable than, than and, and so what does efficiency mean in terms of um, human intellectual pursuit? It's, it's really, it means working together. And so what we find when we study student success, we find the students that go alone in their room and work really hard on their own don't do nearly as well as the students that get together. Um, and really, the most successful students are typically the ones that integrate their social life with their study life. And, uh, you know, this has been seen when people study different cultures or just by studying different populations of students within one culture at, at universities. And so. Um, you know, the most recent study I read about in this was actually looking at, you know, this is, a, they took groups of stan students at Stanford, engineering students, and they said, <clears throat> you know, what are the different study habits and outcomes of students who are Asian American, Caucasian American, and African American who have almost the exact same SAT scores and grade point averages when they come to school? And what they found is that the student, the Asian Americans had the greatest tendency to work together to, to have their social life and their technical life and science life be one group, and they had the highest, typically the highest performance from the students that were studied. The um, Caucasian Americans usually did a good job of having a, a group um, study habits, but then socialized separately, um, and they had the second group. And the African Americans had the, the strongest tendency to try to work alone, and that that was probably the primary reasons the students of the same, and they didn't do as well. Um, in terms of graduation rate and grades, and, and that, that you know, the mindset of working together is, is so important in, in, in science and technology that, you know, there's so many places where you can get confused or get stuck, but if you've got three other people who are with you, right, maybe that's the part they thought was easy, and then, the, you know, the trip becomes much smoother. So, so being social for an, for an a student will be better, right? Absolutely. But that doesn't mean getting drunk every weekend. That's right. I mean, technically social. That's right. Exactly. <laughs> you don't want to study the effects of alcohol on the human bio is not what we mean by collaboration. <laughs>
<laughs> so how do you see Mexico as a country in terms of uh, development of technology? Or you had uh, a grad students from Mexico. I was one of them yes. Yes. at the time. Um, do you think uh, that the, the country is preparing well, well-trained engineers, well-trained scientists? So, so the students who have become either professional practicing engineers or scientists in, in industry or labs or in academia that I've seen from Mexico have all been outstanding. And I don't think there's, you know, there's no, re there's nothing about Mexico that's different that says, you know, Mexico can't succeed and everybody else can. That, that makes no sense. Um, you know, when I look at, at, at the things for success, right, there's that, that collaborative teamwork, um, which is easier today than ever because you can collaborate live or you can collaborate, you know, virtually. Um, you know, the other thing I like to say is that you can see what either a people or a society values by where they spend their time and their money, right? And so, um, you know, as investments go into technology in, in Mexico and, and into education and building up universities, then there's going to be success. I mean, the, you know, the ingredients aren't secret. You know, in, in my lifetime, we've seen, um, you know, Japan rise in terms of, of education and technology. Um, and Japan actually did it a little differently. They didn't invest heavily in their own universities early on. They invested in sending students to the US. And then they invested in their own industry. And so when they invested- Sometimes in, recruiting those students, and, right? And then, right, and then bringing, you know, unlike most students that come to the US from other countries, the Japanese were the most likely to go back to Japan. Um, because the government investment was in, in the career paths. And so, you know, the, the relationship between government and industry, um, it's hard to find the border sometimes in Japan. That's just the way their culture works. Um, and so when, you know, when Sumitomo decided to start working in superconductivity in 1987, there was never a discussion of we'll do it for this many years and then decide whether to continue. They just continue, right? So why is high-speed rail, you know, why is Japan leading in maglev um, development? Because when they started the program in the late 60s, or early 70s, they just kept going, right? Because they have that integrated partnership between government and industry. And that's one way to do it. Um, but the key is really, you know, having a, a societal decision that education and science and technology is important and investing in it um, and investing in, in you know, the education side. And one thing that's impressive here in Juarez is that um, you, know, you have a number of high-tech companies who are now putting infrastructure in um, and building capabilities. Those will be here for a long time, right? I mean, companies don't invest in, in um, infrastructure for the short term. They invest for the long term. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I was visiting, um, I was in Houston yesterday visiting ExxonMobil, and I asked them about some of their strategies for, for different investments, and they said they're always in for the long game. They're never in the short game, right? In the long game, if you invest in science and technology and human resources, the long game will always succeed, right? Because humanity doesn't stand still. And for over a thousand years, if not longer, engineering has been saving the world, solving the world's problems. Engineering is gonna continue to solve the world's problems, and only by taking the long game does that happen. We in Mexico, on the past 30 years, mm -hmm. we rely on oil, right? Mm -hmm. It's an oil uh, country. And we were having this discussion while we were driving here yeah. about the new techniques and the mm -hmm. new technology that needs to be applied in, into mm -hmm. that field too. Right. And that's the reason why the federal government that is running right now, they create the, what is called the energy reform. Mm -hmm. So the energy reform allows some investors from outside the country, no longer in the governmental sphere, mm -hmm to come and, and do engineering work and then to extract some oil and commercialize mm -hmm. the oil and mm -hmm. so far. So you think that a strategy would be good to accelerate the economy in a country or there's a bias there? That's a so I'm obviously, I mean, I'm not an economist. Correct. Right? And, uh, um, but on your, when, on your when, experience. Yeah, when I look at, so if I look at the energy world, right? Mm -hmm. You can look at four different, three different examples, right? So you have um, the Middle East, Right, where to some extent, I mean, there's differences, of course, but to some extent, Iran and Saudi Arabia are taking similar approaches. Um, you have China, and then you have, say, you know, the U.S. And um, I honestly don't know enough about the Russian economy, or I'd include them as a large one also. So um, Iran is actually investing heavily in renewables, even though they're one of the biggest oil-producing countries in the world, right? Because they see oil um, not as a resource they want to burn, Right, but as a resource, they want to transition. They want to translate into money. I was going to say dollars, but they don't trade in dollars. Um, they want to translate their oil into money. Use that money to invest in the longer term in 
you know, wind and, and green technology. Saudi is doing similar. Saudi is taking their money and they're throwing huge amount of money into universities, right? So KAUST is just a scientific playground if you, if you want to live in Saudi Arabia, um, and if you're a man, um, but not if you're a woman. Uh, and so that they're, they're also saying, you know, they're also recognizing that um, oil is still a robust source of revenue and will be for a while. Um, but in the long term, at some point, you know, oil will peak and, and turn over. Now, when I was a kid in the 70s, we thought oil would peak in terms of production and then go down. Um, a lot of people in the media didn't know the difference between um, a reserve and a resource. So when they'd hear, oh, the reserves only last until here, they didn't realize that meant if you dig another well, you've just expanded reserves. Um, the thinking now is actually, I would say, is more along the lines of not when does oil supply peak and go down, but when does oil demand peak and go down, right? Because of alternative technologies, because of concerns of global warming and, and the need to draw down CO2. And so, you know, it's interesting to see, you know, Iran and Saudi Arabia thinking long term, you know, using their oil as a resource to, to, to plan for the long term, right? And now, you know, if you ask the question which country in the world is probably leading um, in terms of, um, you know, green technologies, it's probably China. Right? So they're a, they're a massive, they're an importer for, oil, uh, for, for energy resources, but they're trying to, you know, they have a, a century's history of, you know, not wanting, of, that's led them to not want to ever be dependent on anyone else. Um, and they've gone through some, you know, some terrible times in their history because of, because of uh, foreign influence. So um, they are becoming, you know, in many ways the leader. And I think their vision, um, of course, you never know China's vision because they're, you know, they're, they're they don't have open press and they're quiet about their planning. But it, and the indication is that China's vision is to be um, you know, the green energy version of OPEC in 10, 20, 40, 50 years, whenever that, that transformation takes place. So if I was you know, to be presumptuous to, to advise you know, Mexican long-term planning, I would say you've got oil as a resource and use it to generate wealth, but invents that wealth in, in things with a longer horizon, things that will elevate um, your population educationally and will lead to, you know, economies that are probably going to last throughout the century, not throughout the decade. Now, the relationship between the U.S. and Mexico is always being strong. Mm -hmm. And do you think, we'll, do you think with, the, with the, the, the way the, the politics and environment... I thought you said we weren't going to talk politics. Yeah, you would, I said <laughs> that, right? But what I was trying to go uh, is... Uh, Penn State will be open for, for Mexican students to, to go there for PhDs? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, politics goes up and down. Correct. And, um, you know, the reality is in the U.S., um, there's, there's the political sphere, which makes a lot of noise. Mm -hmm. um, there's the business sphere, which drives the economy and drives most ultimate political decisions. And the business sphere is already here. Right? American companies are in Mexico. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there can be a lot of political talk about this and that, about, you know, was NAFTA good or bad? Um, the reality is American businesses are partnering with Mexico in a much deeper way than 20, 30 years ago. And, we'll, and, and they're going to continue to. There's, you know, the only time American businesses have started partnering in, in other countries and then pulled out was when that country, you know, like Iran, right, mm -hmm. had a revolution and threw them out, mm -hmm. right? American businesses, you know, typically don't let the government get in their way. Um, and I will also say, you know, the, the people I know, um, you know, appreciate the relationship with Mexico as, as being mutually beneficial. And, uh, you know, the river is not, not artificial, of course, right? The river has been on the planet for, for century, for millennia. Um, but political boundaries are artificial, right? And, you know, if you ask the average American what they want in life and the average Mexican what they want in life, it's fundamentally the same. Mm -hmm. Right? They want the, you want your children to be healthy and happy and, and, and have a better life than you did. Correct. And, and as long as those human connections remain, you know, remain true, I don't think you know, local pol or time dependent politics are going to get in the way of a, of a relationship that's driven as much by history and, and as it is geography. Um, and if, there's, you know, if we talk about what's the impact of technology in the last 30 years, right, it's made the world smaller. Um, you know, the ease with which you, know, you can communicate between um, Juarez and, and the U.S., uh, anywhere in the U.S., not just across the border, but, you know, the whole country. You can collaborate with people in Seattle, with people at MIT, as easily as people at UTEP now because communications has changed. So even, you know, an example of a more extreme 
relationship, the U.S. and Iran, I have Iranian students in my group, and they communicate with their family every day, right? And, and, what's up? And what's up, right. <laughs> and, and, you know, when one of my students' you know, mother takes ill, he goes back and sees her, and then he comes back. I mean, it's, you know, there's, there's the political noise, and then there's the, the human reality. So to finalize this interview, because it's about time for yep. you to start giving your lecture, mm -hmm. I, I, want you, I want you to give three advices to three, three different pe uh, populations, three different uh, sets of people. Okay. Undergrad students, mm -hmm. grad students, mm -hmm. and faculty. Okay. What, would you, what would you recommend to do to succeed? Because at the end of the day, that's what we want to do, right? right? You go to school to get educated, to earn more money, to improve the quality of life. Right. On your own experience, you've been through those phases. Mm -hmm. So what would you recommend? We had this conversation when yeah. I was in Tallahassee, but that okay. was your, your, your grad student. Yeah. And now it's different. And you, you have, have to tell me if I, give, if I say the same. I'll probably say something different now. I don't know. You have to tell me what, <laughs> I don't remember what I said then, so you'll have to tell me. I hope it was good advice. It was a good uh, advice. That's good. why I went to the PhD <laughs> program. So I would say um, to the faculty, this is probably more self-evident. To the students, um, on the scientific side, um, be married to the fundamentals. Right? In the end, you know, I'll hear people say, oh, you know, I took thermodynamics and mechanical engineering, and you took you know, material science thermodynamics. It's just thermodynamics. Right? Gibbs didn't know the difference between mechanical and, and chemical. It's just thermo. So, so be married and true to the, the fundamentals because they'll always steer you right. Um, to, and to all three groups, I say, you know, don't, this goes back to what I said before, don't try to go at it alone. Right? When I see faculty have you know, what they think are big discoveries and they become um, you know, closed off, they don't want to share samples, they don't want to share ideas, they want to try to do it all themselves, you know, they never get where they think they're going to get because they're trying to do it alone. Whereas, um, you know, people who have a result and share it, right, get it into the, the literature and collaborate um, and, and, you know, spread the ideas as far as they can because no one person is going to have all the answers and all the, the great ideas. Um, and, you know, that, that working together, we always get farther. Um, and you asked for three pieces of advice. The third piece is... Um, is kind of a combination, I'll just say A and a B. So part A is enjoy it, right? Enjoy what you're doing, right? So um, people, you know, so I, I, I could have given you the answer I used to give when you asked me why science. Um, the answer I used to, I've given most of the time, and I should have today, is of all of my hobbies, it's the one that had the most income potential, right? So I love doing photography, but I knew I wasn't gonna make a living as a photographer, right? I love music, but you don't want to hear me sing. You wouldn't stay very long. Um, <laughs> and, and so, you know, and treat your career like it's a hobby that you want to do, Correct. right? And there's always going to be parts of it you don't want to do, but that's true even in any hobby, right? Um, and then with that is remember why you're doing it, right? And there's many reasons to do it. Some people do science because they love science, and they do it for the sake of the breakthrough, and there's no, that's great. Other people do science because they want to see, you know, at some point in their career, some stranger walking down the street doing something different because of what they did, right? So some people do it for the love of the science, some do it for the impact on humanity. But always remember why you're doing it, because that's, that's your, your own self-motivation. And then the last piece, I'll give you one more, okay. is you know, manage your career. And when I say manage your career, I don't mean <clears throat> you know, plan three steps ahead and make sure those are the steps you take. It means you know, think about expanding opportunities. Um, don't get locked into one to one mindset, um, be open to doing something completely different that you didn't think you were ever going to do, um, you know, and, and participate in, in, in the broader community so that you, you know, opportunities come um, because you're open to, to doing broader things. And if it gets rocky, don't get off the road, right? Don't get right. I mean, so I was having a conversation um, yesterday with, uh, with someone who was talking about, they have a, they have a daughter who was in high school. And um, she did well in AP Physics, and then she wanted to do AP Economics. And the AP Economics teacher um, sent an email to the mom and said, you know, I don't think she should do this. It's going to be very difficult for her. And to, which, and to which her mother pushed back and said, don't discourage my daughter. She's doing it. And she got an A. Um, but the point, I was thinking about this story. I said, you know, if it's not difficult, what's the point? I mean, we, we, we've come to this mindset, at least in the U.S., hopefully not here in Mexico, that difficult is viewed as a bad thing, right? But why is doing something difficult a bad thing, 
right? If everything in life was just easy, you wouldn't accomplish anything. Difficult mm. is, to me, oh, this is going to be difficult is a motivator, not a dissuader. That's right. And so, you know, when things get rocky, that means you finally got to the good part. <laughs> well, finally, I want to thank you for the, distinct, the distinguished pin you. you brought. Oh. The, right? Yes, yes. Wear it with pride, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> so what was the advice I gave you? You said you have the skills, mm -hmm. go finish the PhD, mm -hmm. and don't stop. Don't stop, yeah. And I hope you see you again, and here we are 10 years later having this conversation yes. publicly, and me as a professor, mm -hmm. and, and I'm very with proud this of great you. audience. I'm very proud of where you've gotten. And Sarah down here, Sarah was about seven years, eight years when she went to Tallahassee. And okay, well, we thank you so much for this interview. Thank you. I appreciate and it. Thank you so much. Thank you.